Welcome back. Um, it's a pleasure to invite Dimitri Kleinbock, who will speak on Kinchin type theorems. He's going to give a series of lectures. This is his first one. Yes. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here. It's a great place, and thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me. Actually, when I uh, decided to come here, I just thought of giving a talk. And then I figured out that uh, Anish wants me to give a series of lectures or a course. So uh, I'm not quite sure what it is going to be. It's going to be a talk somehow morphed into a course. So I understand that there are many graduate students. So maybe I'll start very slowly. And in the first uh, uh, class of this uh, course, uh, I won't prove anything. And we'll just uh, discuss the problems and uh, some approaches. And then uh, uh, there will be some proofs uh, tomorrow. And then maybe a final exam. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, I'm also grateful to Amos, who kind of introduced a lot of philosophy, which, I'll, uh, which will be helpful for me. I won't exactly do what he does, but uh, it's important to kind of understand the whole picture. And uh, uh, so the title is uh, uh, Hinchin type theorems for homogeneous polynomials at inter, for values of uh, polynomials at integer points. In fact, it will be more general than polynomials. Uh, and uh, I think the only, uh, uh, the only uh, mysterious word is Hinchin type, right? The rest are, is clear for high school students, polynomials, integers, nothing uh, else. So, so I'll try to explain what. It is, and uh, just start with, uh, uh, with the motivation. And the motivational uh, statement uh, for me would be uh, Oppenheim conjecture, which is the uh, theorem of Margulis. So uh, I start with f, uh, rn to r. It will be. Uh, uh, Indefinite uh, quadratic form, maybe non singular also, just to uh, 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 remove uh, bad examples, and uh, not proportional to a rational form. Uh, okay. Uh, Indefinite conductive form. Is that, is that better? Uh, and uh, the, con the conclusion is that uh, so you look at uh, the values at integers. In fact, uh, uh, you know that f of zero is zero, so you might as well exclude it, and then you take the closure and. Uh, uh, zero uh, is in this closure. So zero is an accumulation point of uh, uh, the values of f. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, more is known. In fact, f of zn is just dense. Uh, what? Indefinite quadratic form, not proportional to a rational form, uh, right? If n is at least three, this was uh, was coming, certainly, uh, and uh, right, and uh, uh, so the remark uh, remark is that it is not true if n is equal to two. Uh, but this, uh, this is remark one, and it's not, not very important for me. Uh, the reason why it is not very important is remark two, uh, that uh, the, the upshot of uh, uh, this wonderful theorem uh, is that it holds or all forms, well, all uh, minus this uh, obvious counterexamples. So it's not really a statement about something generic. 
we really have to go for uh, for everything. Uh, and then uh, uh, and then once uh, uh, once this is uh, this is done, uh, a natural question is okay how to make this better. So we know that. Uh, Zero is approximate by integer values. Let's see how fast it happens. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, number theorists try to come up with some kind of notion to uh, attach a nice uh, name to it. So let me uh, uh, make a definition, which I'll work uh, with uh, for the rest of the course. Uh, I'll say that. Uh, so f uh, doesn't have to be a quadratic form. Just take any function of n variables, real function of n variables. Uh, uh, and let's say that f is psi approximable. And for me, psi will be uh, something like this. OK, so it's, usually, it's, it's always a, these guys are called approximating functions, so it's some kind of non-negative function, which will, uh, in most cases, be uh, non-increasing. Sometimes it's not important. Sometimes it's important. Uh, 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 anyway, the psi psi approximable, if uh, uh, there exists infinitely many uh, vectors v in Zn, such that the value of f of v is less than uh, or less or equal to psi of the norm of v. Okay, so what can uh, you notice that there is a norm here, so it's kind of uh, sensitive with respect to the norm. You change the norm, you formally have a different definition. If all goes well, we won't really, uh, the norm won't bother us too much. But for now, it depends, so it's kind of norm is built in. Uh, and uh, then uh, it uh, clearly quantifies what happens here. Uh, psi, uh, so Oppenheim conjecture is just for psi being a constant function. So for every constant function, it, uh, psi, we get this, uh, uh, this psi approximability of, uh, of these guys. Okay. Now, uh, what uh, uh, if we start, uh, so, so let me say a few words uh, about uh, this uh, uh, case. Uh, so maybe remark three. Uh, remark three. Uh, take a model quadratic form. Uh, for example, f zero of x will be x one squared plus x p squared minus x p plus one squared minus x q, q squared, uh, sorry, x n squared. So it's signature p and q. Uh, and then uh, uh, all quadratic forms of signature p q uh, uh, can be written as f composed with g where G is a, uh, well, okay, up to, if you forget, uh, forget about scaling, this will be just S, L, and R. Okay, so, uh, so what, is, uh, what, what, is, uh, what is happening here is that uh, uh, given this F0, there is an orbit of F0, so G acts nicely in the set of quadratic forms. In fact, uh, uh, it is uh, G modular. H, where H is stabilizer of this quadratic form. It's a closed subgroup, so it's a nice manifold. And uh, uh, the statement was that for all points on this manifold, except for some ex exceptional guys, uh, something happens. Okay, and uh, usually uh, people doing metric number theory uh, start with these objects and then try to classify object according to the rate of approximation. So, uh, uh, so basically, uh, well, I can ask the question. What are conditions on psi equivalent to almost every or almost no f in uh, 
this uh, orbit of F0 being psi approximable. So, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a con condition which uh, in other contexts arises in uh, classical De Fontaine approximation, and uh, this is the subject of Hinch's theorem. Uh, okay, so okay, so so f uh, f is a f is a quadratic quadratic form like this. If uh, g is uh, uh, an element of S L and R, you can consider the or f composed with g, which is just uh, of x, which is just f of g x. Okay, so you just uh, change coordinates, and then. Uh, uh, a theorem in linear algebra says that every uh, quadratic form can be diagonalized. Uh, now, uh, okay, there, there are some coefficients, but uh, after a diagonal matrix, and if you insist on determinant one, it's just plus or minus ones. That's, uh, that's exactly what, that, that's what I was alluding to. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to do two things. I want to change the setup and try to consider almost every form and see what happens. So what, what, what is a generic picture? What, what we should expect? And uh, uh, number two, uh, I don't insist on having a quadratic form. I can start with, a, with some function. Okay, maybe it will have stabilizer. Maybe it won't have a stabilizer, I don't know. In any case, uh, the orbit of this uh, function of zero will be g divided by the stabilizer. And then I can, uh, I can ask the question, uh, so the question, uh, about almost every f here is equivalent to uh, uh, to f zero composed. So it's about uh, f zero composed with g for uh, almost every g in uh, g. Now, we can think of G as SLNR, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, in general, it will be some group acting on, uh, on, this, on these objects, on RM. Uh, maybe a fine group, for example. And then, and then we will try to see what happens. So, uh, and the sub question. And I'm uh, spelling it out because it's somehow something like this appeared already in the talk of Amos yesterday. Uh, what about? Uh, phi sub s of x, which is one over x to minus uh, one over x to the s. Okay, if you just take powers, then what is the critical power where you change from almost every to almost no, or maybe from almost from all to nothing, or something like this? Okay, and those are called exponents of the Fontaine approximation. So these these guys are important. Uh, okay, so uh, so maybe uh, maybe I'll uh, uh, make a little historical. Remark, uh, so I was uh, uh, a graduate student at Yale uh, when Margulis uh, only proved Oppenheim conjecture quite recently, maybe five or six years ago. He was working with uh, Shahar and Alex on this uh, quantitative Oppenheim. So it was uh, around all the time. And at the same time, I was uh, interested in uh, Hinchin's theorem or uh, high dimensional versions of Hinchin's theorem and how they can be translated into dynamics. And so I, I was always saying to him, at least a few times, okay, so you have this open high conjecture, why not do this? Why not uh, introduce some, some approximating function and study almost all forms? And his response, well, well, almost all forms, I mean, it's boring, it's not interesting, it's, it's extremely easy. Uh, I mean, the whole point of what we did is that we really want to understand everything, right? Or maybe put some specific Defantine condition, then, then he's happy. Uh, but uh, uh, but if 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 you want to do almost all, I mean, just do some ergodic theory, and uh, and you'll be done. Uh, and then so it kind of discouraged me, or at least it gave me an impression that things are actually quite easy. Uh, but then something interesting starts started happening. I mean, the, the people started writing papers. For example, Anish and Duby Kellner, and then uh, Anish and Damos and Alex, when they were proving something about Oppenheim conjecture, and somehow they didn't. I mean, it, they were, weren't able to nail it. So, so let me let me tell you what. Uh, so, what what is known? Uh, 
Uh, for example, we can take f of x, y, z equal to x squared plus y squared minus z squared. So it's a form of signature to one equations. And, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, there is a theorem by uh, Gosh and Kellner that uh, uh, f composed with g is psi s approximal every s uh, less less than 1 uh, yeah i uh, i remember some confusion uh, over the priority of your co-authors but uh, you just go ahead and settle this yourself i put you here and then you arrange them <laughs> <laughs> According to priorities, so uh, so that's uh, uh, that's what happens. I mean, and some and it doesn't doesn't give a criterion for psi to be uh, f so that uh, uh, okay. So what what is missing uh, for almost all almost every g? This is psi, psi approximate for every as bigger than one, and it's optimal in the sense that uh, if uh, it's not if uh, s is bigger than one. So it's clearly the critical exponent. Uh, when I try to ask what happens at the critical exponent, I get very confused looks. I mean, we don't know. Our methods don't give anything. And indeed, uh, I mean, yesterday we saw a flavor of the methods. The methods, I mean, you do representation theory, you start uh, averaging, you apply mean ergodic theorem. Uh, it's quite effective, so it has some rate, and you take this rate, and if you are very lucky, your, what you get here is, uh, is quite close. So maybe I'll uh, say again uh, why uh, ergodic theory comes up here. But uh, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that I'll, I'll actually try to stay away from this method and use another method. Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is some, uh, uh, the result of uh, these three people with some input from Duby, I guess. Uh, okay, and then, and then there was a, a uh, an alternative method, which uh, 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 is something I'll talk about later, uh, by uh, uh, Atreya Margulis, and then uh, a follow-up paper of Kelmer and Shu Cheng Yu. Uh, 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 not for almost every G, yes. Yeah, uh, for example, you can have uh, uh, just, uh, it can be a rational form, and then you just have, uh, if it represents zero, of course, uh, it will be approximable no matter what. Uh, okay, so, so, so what, uh, what, what, what do you have here? For example, you take uh, f uh, of, uh, so almost every f of signature, PQ, uh, or let's say uh, uh, in n dimensions, uh, if uh, is a, a, a uh, okay. Let, let me uh, let me state let let me state a more general uh, version. F of x will be x one to the d up to x e to the d. So I'm now talking about polynomials. D is even minus x e plus 1 over d, uh, xn over d, and then uh, f composed with g is, is psi approximable, psi s approximable for every s less than n minus d. So you can see that it nicely generalizes uh, the ternary quadratic forms business, right? Here d is 2 and n is 3, and 1 is this critical exponent. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is what happens when something is known, but uh, this something uh, is kind of one-sided. You only do it for uh, quite specific functions, and if you try to push it, uh, push the method further, you run into some obstacles. Okay. Any questions? Any any comments from? Uh, 
so, so again, for again for almost every G, I keep keep forgetting this. Uh, in definite form, so I put some pluses and minuses here. Yes. Uh, n is not uh, n is not equal to p. Yes, yes. Uh, so indefinite. Uh, uh, no, G uh, SOPQ just doesn't change the form, but but you want to change it. So G here is uh, SLNR. Okay, and uh, uh, again, almost uh, every form means almost every. In the thing in the quotient of G by SOPQ. Uh, okay, so uh, so that's what uh, uh, this is a type of uh, results that uh, people were considered, and here uh, we were considering, and here the method was completely different. And I'll uh, basically uh, the point of uh, my uh, class is to explain this method and see what else and tell you what else it can. Uh, uh, yield. And uh, uh, before uh, going there, let me, uh, since I'm uh, giving a class for graduate students, uh, let me look at a very easy example. I mean, this is, this is quite complicated, right? We're talking about some polynomials of higher degree on high dimensional spaces. Why don't we just take something extremely simple? Uh, f of x1, x2 equal to x1. So, oh, and let, let, let me just under, try to understand this function before going further, because this is really crucial. Okay, so what, what is going on? So we have a nice linear function on R2, and now I want to consider uh, its orbit under SLNR. So what, what is its orbit? What is this OF, which is F composed with G, where G is? We have to understand this before moving on. So I'm just I'm asking graduate students or undergraduates. Are there any undergraduates? Undergraduates will just nail it right away. For graduate students, it's harder. <laughs> so, so what what do we have? What are what is in the orbit of a linear function? All linear functions, right? I'm not sure where this came from. So this is just uh, just the set of uh, uh, functions uh, of the form uh, q1, q2, going to alpha1, q1 plus alpha2, q2, where alpha. Uh, so so basically basically it's R2, right? Uh, alpha1, alpha2, are real numbers. Okay, you can. Uh, uh, right, so not zero, but uh, but uh, uh, but zero is kind of irrelevant because uh, I won't consider almost all points in this orbit, so I can just ignore zero. Uh, okay, so uh, so that's what you want to understand. You want to understand the small values. So you have uh, alpha one q one plus alpha q two q two less than psi of the norm of q. This is the inequality you want to. Uh, to solve, and you want to see what happens for almost all alpha 1, alpha 2, de depending on this psi, when you have zero measure, when you have full measure. Well, how we can approach this problem? Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, of course, as you observed, this vector is not zero, so one of the coordinates is not zero. For example, alpha 2 is not zero. Then let's just divide, uh, and you'll have one here, so it will be the same as alpha, alpha q plus p. And uh, now uh, uh, you have the norm of this vector q, uh, but uh, this vector q is up to a constant the same as q1. So if your psi is nice and regular, I mean, it doesn't fluctuate too much, you can just say that it is phi of q. And so here you're just solving uh, this problem, which is the subject of classical Hinge theorem. And you know the condition, the sum of psi of k is finite and infi or infinite, then you have uh, almost no or almost all. 
So it's a theorem of Kinchin. So here, at least for this function, for the, in this linear case, we have a nice condition, which is known uh, for a while. And uh, uh, people who have seen this before uh, know that uh, sometimes there are multidimensional generalizations. And it's very, very easy to uh, get it here. You just look at f x1 up to xn equal to maximum x1 up to xk. If instead you study this function and do the same, what you'll reduce to is just Hinchin theorem for a system of linear forms, of uh, k linear forms and n minus k variables. And again, there is a condition here, but for this function, it will be uh, the sum of uh, x to n minus k minus 1, psi uh, of x to the k, something like this. Well, it's not important what condition it is, but somehow it shows up. So the, in the linear case, uh, there has been some work, and uh, it's, now, uh, it's clear what, uh, what happens. The question is, I mean, is it possible to do something like this in the quadratic case? So this is what uh, I'll try to, uh, to talk about. And uh, uh, let me, uh, before uh, going further, let me make another remark. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I can do it here. So uh, all this time when I was talking about results of uh, uh, Anish with uh, co-authors uh, and also Andrea Margulis and Kelmer, I was actually downplaying what they did. And thank, I'm grateful for them for not catching me right away. Because they actually uh, proved uh, uh, something uh, stronger, and uh, uh, the flavor of the stronger results we already saw yesterday in uh, the talks of Amos, and probably we'll hear it again, uh, hear something like this again uh, uh, in half an hour. So let me try to uh, uh, make another definition. Uh, let's say that F is uniformly psi approximable. If uh, uh, what happens, uh, if uh, there exists n0, such that if n is uh, bigger than n0, then there exists an integer vector, non-zero, with uh, f of v less than psi of n and the norm of v less than n. I don't know what, which inequalities you want to use. So let's, uh, so I want us to compare these two conditions. And in the Fontaine approximation, this is called uniform Fontaine approximation. And here, some peop uh, people say, for example, asymptotic Fontaine approximation. Here, you just need infinitely many solutions of this. And uh, here, you really want arbitrary big number n. And for every n, you must have a solution. So what is stronger? Is it true that one condition implies another? What do you think? Yes? This is stronger. OK, why is it stronger? Uh, you have this, uh, right? So, so you take big N, you find this V, and uh, of course, uh, 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 then you have, you want to have this, right? And then you are done. And why do you have this? Because of monotonicity. So here it's important that psi is monotonic, right? Would you with me? Now there is a gap in this proof. Actually, it's not true what you just said. Anybody can help? So the gap is as follows. For big N, we found V, but it's not enough to find V. We actually need to find infinitely many of them. Then we have this approximability. 
If we just have one solution, okay, who cares? So how do we get infinitely many? Sometimes we can't, right? Because, uh, uh, I mean, if, if, this, if, we get, if we have this and if this is not zero, then we just keep going until we reach this uh, part. So psi, uh, uh, we assume that psi goes to zero. Okay, and then we get the new solution. Uh, but, uh, so this implies, unless we have uh, f of b is zero for some b in the n. Then, then we don't know what to do, right? We just have one solution and it works for all n, right? But this is, this is kind of an exceptional situation. So uh, it actually works. Uh, modulo uh, uh, f's which represent integers, uh, sorry, represent zero over integers, and if we are interested in almost every form, this clearly has a, uh, gives you a set of measure zero, right? It's a set of solutions of uh, polynomial equations, in some sense. Or some, some uh, uh, so, so if we're talking about generic uh, Fs, we can just uh, dem demand that this doesn't happen, and then you're right, then it goes through. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, indeed, this uniform condition is stronger, let's agree to it, is stronger than the non-uniform condition, okay? And uh, it's, it's two different problems. Characterize, uh, uh, they, uh, have a uh, fine condition on psi equivalent to almost every f being psi approximal, and the same for uniformly psi approximal. So what uh, 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 Anish and co-authors, and also Atreya Margulis, and also Kelmer and you did. Uh, they actually uh, found uh, some critical exponents such that F composed with G are uniformly psi approximable for almost every G and S bigger than, uh, sorry, S smaller than S zero. Okay, so, uh, and that's, that's exactly the uh, inequalities that Amos was writing yesterday. Uh, okay, so, so this is, uh, so they actually found, uh, they actually showed that almost every form satisfies this stronger condition of uniform approximability. And it's this condition that, uh, uh, for this condition, it's not clear what happens if S is a critical exponent, if S is equal to the critical exponent. So what I am going to tell you is that if you, uh, Leave this strong condition aside, it's too uh, difficult for us, and concentrate on this weaker condition, then it's very easy to find the if an uh, necessary and sufficient condition on Psi. At least this is something we want to understand. This problem is still interesting. It's, uh, it's quite challenging to find uh, the uh, necessary and sufficient condition for Psi where, with uniform approximabilities. For example, it is not known uh, in this setup. And uh, uh, uniform approximability, when you start just by approximating uh, real numbers by rational numbers or real vectors by rational vectors, uh, goes by the name of improving Dirichlet's theorem. And uh, one can ask on, uh, 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 one can similarly uh, write this uniform version of this result. So you'll have uh, alpha Q plus P less than Psi of N and Q is less than and, and you want to uh, have this, uh, uh, you want to find conditions on Psi equivalent to this being solvable for all N big enough. Okay, and this uh, uh, is something that uh, I managed to work out with my graduate student Nick Wadley a few years ago in dimension one, and in high dimensions it's still not clear what is the right condition. Okay, so this uniform, uh, finding criteria for uniform approximation is much trickier. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe it's, uh, uh, it's some uh, uh, it's an interesting problem to think about. Uh, but uh, finding criteria for uh, uh, this setup is something we should be able to understand completely by the end of this class. 
Okay, and so it's a rather easy situation, and it, uh, it's actually quite illuminating. It tells you what, what happens and what else can be done and what else is difficult. Okay, so in a sense, uh, Margulis was right. That's what the point I'm trying to make. So I'm talking about some problem which is kind of boring because it follows naturally from some mathematics which was, was, which was around for a while. But uh, I had no idea about it, and the people I asked also had no idea. So at least let's talk this through, and then this will be closed. Uh, any questions? Uh, what? Uh, the complement uh, of what? So, so this is a definition. It's a uniform approximate. If this happens, so that's uh, uh, that's what the, what what they did. That uh, 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 if s is uh, uh, less than a zero, then almost every is uniformly approximable. If s is bigger than s zero, then uh, almost no is even uh, doesn't satisfy the weaker condition. Uh, we know that it's. Uh, uh, do we know that it's not uh, uh, not all G? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, pro probably this this can be done by some kind of uh, Dirichlet type argument. Uh, but uh, 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 yeah, I mean, so so it's a uh, it's a. Uh, it's a set which, at least, it's, it's a set which is contained in this set. Okay, so you might ask for a complement of this set. This is easier. But, I mean, there are many, uh, I mean, once you run into this basic setup, there are many questions you can ask. Some of them are easy, some of them are easy to state, but very difficult to answer. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, I still have time to... Uh, uh, at least state the theorem. So, so what? Uh, uh, I mean, another uh, actually another. Uh, uh, before I go further, another uh, aspect of their work that uh, I'm not taking is that in all these uh, uh, situations, it's actually possible to uh, have this uh, error, to have this free term, and instead of approximating zero, approximate a given value, and also have this uniform. Condition. This is something that uh, uh, also, I mean, it's interesting to uh, make uh, it into this definition and try to find, uh, in a sense, efficient conditions. Some, something like this can be done, but I'll stay away for the purpose of this course and uh, only talk about approximating zero. Okay. So, uh, Okay, so let me uh, let me try to state uh, uh, a theorem. Let me try to state a theorem and just need uh, a few definitions. So uh, so I'll work with f f uh, in. Uh, all these examples, f was a nice homogeneous polynomial, uh, but for me it's not important. Uh, but something is important. I'll say that f is sub-homogeneous. If uh, there exists a, a positive number d, such that uh, f of uh, Tx is not greater than t to d f of x, say for every t between 0 and 1. Okay, so I mean, in a homogeneous situation, you would have equality. Here, I only want this. And uh, let me have another definition. This uh, function psi, uh, I mean, it'll, it's interesting to have a criterion for just all possible functions with, say, with Bentonicity assumption. Number theorists like to do this. They want to make as uh, few assumptions on psi as possible, but uh, uh, 
Somehow we need one assumption, and it's not clear how to get rid of it. It's also an interesting question. Uh, let me say that psi is regular. If uh, there exists uh, two constants a and b, such that psi of ax is uh, bigger than b psi of x for every x. Uh, so here a is bigger than 1. Uh, OK, so, so what, what is going on? Psi is a, a function like in this picture. It goes down. Uh, but uh, I don't want it to drop like this. This is bad. So I want it to go down nicely in a uniform way. So of course, these power functions are uh, fine. Uh, some functions times logs is also fine. So this is, a, uh, this is the condition. So if you change the value of the argument, say, by factor of 2, you're not going to uh, uh, change uh, the value of the function much. Okay, so again, it, uh, uh, the ratio here is uniformly bounded. OK, so, uh, so let me state the theorem. And now uh, uh, the theorem is, uh, so everything I'm talking about uh, from this point, or maybe even before, is a joint work with uh, Michel Scanderi. Greatest student at Brandeis. So uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, okay. And maybe before uh, before I state the theorem, let me go back to this definition. Uh, so f is psi approximable if and only if there exist infinitely many Solutions. So what are we solving, actually? Uh, now, uh, when I explain this, it will be, everybody will be able to guess what is the statement of the theorem. Uh, so equivalently, you can define the set A f psi, which is the set of x in Rn, such that f, uh, absolute value of f of x is not bigger than psi of the norm of x. And then, uh, uh, so this is, this is just a definition. And then this condition is equivalent to saying that uh, the number of uh, Zn intersection with uh, A f psi is infinite. Okay, so, uh, so in Rn, uh, you'll have uh, some set which uh, in the case of quadratic form, it is something like this. It is something which stretches to infinity. And then, uh, uh, and then you have uh, integer points. And sometimes you have infinitely many integer points. And that's when you have this approximability condition. That's all. all right, is that clear? That's uh, uh, the geometric way of saying it. And so, so now I claim that uh, if uh, f is subhomogeneous, And uh, psi is regular and also non-increasing. Uh, then uh, uh, f uh, composed with g is or is not psi approximable for almost every g in g, if and only if uh, the, this set A f of psi uh, has an infinite or finite measure. OK, so this, uh, I mean, if we uh, uh, only consider this uh, approximability condition, not demanding uniformity, then it's about uh, uh, having infinitely many integer points in some set, which could be a finite measure and which could be a infinite measure. And if it's finite measure, 
there's no way you can get infinitely many integer points or, uh, for uh, uh, for almost all things. But uh, I mean, there there is something interesting which is which goes on, right? So. Uh, 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 so here, uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, so this picture, in this picture, uh, uh, I am talking about the set A F psi. But here, I want to talk about F composed with G, which is a different F, right? So. Each, for each G gives, each give, G gives rise to another set in Rn, so it another, it's another measure, okay? And uh, my condition doesn't uh, say anything about this G. It only say, talks about this F. This is, this is important, okay? So in other words, uh, here, uh, this is a condition of, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a set AF psi, and uh, you can also apply uh, G, and this will be a f composed with g psi. And you really want to look at the integer points here for almost all g. Okay? And uh, the conclusion, I mean, kind of a posteriori conclusion is that uh, this measure is finite if and only if this measure is finite. So you only need to look at this thing. And uh, this is the criteria that you, the criterion that you get. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I guess I only have uh, a few minutes, at least uh, 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 state uh, the, uh, the corollaries. So what, uh, what, what, what could be the conclusions? So uh, for example, uh, You can look at fx1, xd equal to x1 to d plus xp to the d minus xp plus 1 to the d minus xn to the d. So I'm taking the same function as Athea Margulis did, but uh, just now you can have an arbitrary d. Positive, it doesn't have to be an integer. It doesn't have to be an even integer. Uh, there's no polynomial restriction, no matter what. It will be a nice sub, uh, sub homogeneous, in fact, even homogeneous function. Okay, and then the statement is that uh, F composed with G is psi approximable if and only if the integral uh, psi of t, uh, t n minus d plus 1, dt is uh, f is d plus 1 for almost every g, if and only if this integral is infinite. Okay, so it's just, uh, you can put the power, of course, you get critical exponent. If you take psi, which is, which corresponds to precisely this critical exponent, of course, you get uh, infinite measure. So the conclusion is that in the critical exponent, you have Almost everywhere, you still have psi approximability. Okay, or uh, you can uh, be, uh, you can do something fancier and take uh, uh, and say that almost every product of n linear forms in Rn. So, in other words, you take f of x equal x1 up to xn. This is a nice little wood uh, situation, generating little wood's conjecture. And you take the orbit of this. OK, I'm basically done. Uh, then uh, uh, is psi approximable if and only if uh, the integral from, say, 1 to infinity, psi of t over t, log to power n minus 2, t to the n psi of t dt is infinite. 
So it's some some integration. I mean, what where does it come from? It's kind of not interesting. Uh, I mean, not not very interesting. What exactly is this integral? What is important is that you just need to uh, to integrate uh, uh, to to find the, to find the measure of of this set, and it happens to be this, and this is the condition that we want. Uh, okay, questions. So uh, uh, so this. Uh, 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 basically, what what uh, what I'll try to do tomorrow is to explain how this is proved. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, and uh, uh, and this uh, uh, actually actually uh, uh, there won't be a lot of new things in the tomorrow's lecture either because I'll basically review some classical tools that people were using to, to attack these problems for number of decades, so it, I hope it will be educational. It was very educational for me because I learned uh, a lot of stuff during this uh, talk. And so the, the bottom line is that this is actually a very easy theorem, which uh, uh, could easily be proved by Wolfgang Schmidt 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, still, I think, I think it's, uh, it's nice how this all fits together and uh, uh, how we can just assume so little and uh, to get this nest sense efficient condition. Okay, well, so let me stop here for now. And come back